Hello, I'm Mike, and this is Will. We are the Table of Donkeys. Hello. And we're bringing you issue 47 of Warhammer Age of Sigmar Stormbury magazine today, and this issue came with a Nexus Siphon, another new piece of terrain to add to our collection. And you'll be able to see it is that in today's game, the forces of order are trying to establish the are taking the first steps to establish a new city of Sigmar. Well, looking through the issue first, we have some background on the Disciples of Zinch. So these were mentioned in Ether War, but these are the various followers, you know, mutants, mortals, and demons that are followers of the scheming god of magic, uh, chaos god of magic, Zinch. So you've got the mutants like the Zangles, uh, the various mortal cultists who are no doubt mad, although even the uh, lowliest are still capable of some magic. Various demons like those the horror pictured, pictured there that can actually split into two when it's slain so that they uh, can carry on the battle. And uh, being the god of magic, the various sorcerers as each tend to be very powerful wizards. Now some more background on why exactly the battle is raging in Shaman. Came on, it's not exactly clear, but the realm of metal is obviously a, a good source of rare materials and resources, and multiple f factions want to fight over it to, so they can have these resources to produce uh, powerful weapons and magics. So you can roll as to why this specific region is being fought over. And also there's a small map of the realm there and you can just roll to see where the uh, battles are taking place in this uh, magazine. And then some background on the Nexus Siphon we got with this issue. So this is a, often forms the heart of a city of Sigma and it draws up uh, magical energy from deep wellsprings and uh, underground, often built on ley lines as well, that help form the core of a city of Sigma. You can actually produce a sort of spiritual shield to keep any demons or undead from uh, getting too close to the city as well. And so on the next page, you can, um, two tables, one to show where the siphon has been raised and another as to what sort of boon it has on those who come near it. And then the build guide, this is actually a push together train piece. It might look a bit complicated because you've got the, the four quarters of the sphere, but I believe have different notches. So it's, you can't really get them wrong. We certainly can't get the first piece wrong. And then the rest of it goes together fairly simply. Do you have to be a bit careful with the three parts of the base? Uh, wait for them all to dry before you put the centre in, so because they're not terribly sturdy. And it does suggest to keep the top half with the sort of uh, sphere and the le and the pillars separate from the base and the uh, sort of mystical energy to make it easier to paint. And then the painting guide is fairly similar to the Azerite Fountain, that same sort of colour scheme, going with Corax White and then uh, washing it with uh, with Agrex Urshade to make it look all weathered. And then a dry brush of Corax White. To bring it all together so it doesn't look too dark and there's some little bits of mud you want to pick out as well with casual and flesh and then you want uh, using skeleton horde for any bones going over the site of the mystical energy in the middle with corax white but then you have to pick out the casing around the gem that's in the center of the base with rune or brass and get some lead belcher details for some the details on the pillars and then the sphere upper part of the sphere is mostly rune or brass but with also some retributor armor for more some of the more decorative bits and then there's uh, going over with all the various washes we've had up to this point and using corax white to pick out some of the gems or spheres in the upper bits which we'll probably go over later to make them look a bit more magic a bit more magicy and they can see it up to this point but we're also going over some of the older terrain pieces to use some of the techniques you've learned to this up to this point so we're going over the primal air touching up any mistakes and then washing some of the dirt and then dry brushing with corax white over all the rocks and then washing it again because doing the wash after the dry brush because the corax white will look quite harsh over cantor blue and then touching up any of the bones and skeleton parts so we can go over with skeleton horde Various other details like shading the tentacles and the uh, the fire and the crystals, and then also some extra adding some extra colours to the Azerite fountains, touching up any mistakes, and then adding some rune or brass to the fountain and retributor armour. Uh, going over the the fountain with Athonian camo shade on the inside, so it gives it a nice sort of uh, tide mark where water would have been. And there you can see everything up to this point. So now I hand over to Will, and we'll get into today's game. No new rules or tactics articles in this issue, so we're straight to the background for our game, where a new city of Sigmar is being established, and they are constructing the Nexus Siphon, which provides magical power and also magical defence to the new city. But uh, the forces of destruction have found it and are trying to destroy it to set back the progress of the city. So for our army options, the Alliance of Order have to take the Knight Arcanum and the Four Praetors, and then can take either the Arch Revenant or Ilthari, and then the Tree Revenant or Ilthari's Guardians. For the Alliance of Destruction, we have to have the Fungoid Cave Shaman, the Loon Boss, the Five Fanatics, and the Twenty Shooters. 
and then they have the option of either Manok, Lacanning, or Zarbag, and then either the Cunning Crew or Zarbag's Gits. And we have our battle plan Font of Magic, so you can see from the map there we're playing on two battle maps with four objectives. Uh, the territories are along the short edges, a quarter of the way across the board in any case, and the objectives are on the edge of those deployment zones, effectively in the centre of each table quarter, and the Nexus Siphon is placed in the very centre of the board. The, we place all, place all the primal lair scenery pieces once those have been set up, and then roll off the player who wins, chooses who deploys first, and they deploy their entire army. The game will last for five battle rounds, and there are victory points scored for having control of one objective, uh, controlling two objectives, and then a third victory point available if you control more objectives than the opponent. And the Nexus Siphon itself counts as an objective in this game, but only wizards can contest it, so any other unit nearby will not count towards its control. Uh, and as usual we have some uh, playthrough highlights from when Ian and Eve played their game, so you can see what uh, units they picked here and a few of the events that occurred in it. But we'll set up our board and show you the forces we've picked and then get into the game. So here's our battlefield, we can see the Nexus Siphon in the middle, we've got various terrain features, there's all three on the right hand side of the board and the destruction side are all arcane because we rolled uh, twos for them. There's a damned uh, set of vents and then a deadly big skull in the pool up towards objective one. The Nexus Siphon itself uh, does not have a mysterious terrain. Mike won the roll off for deployment and made me deploy first, so we've got the Praetors down by objective two, the Knight Arcanum in the middle, the Arch Revenant which I picked and the Tree Revenants up near Objective 1. I basically went for them because it's just more models than Altharis Guardians. And I can make the Arch Revenant a wizard using the Arcane Tome, so don't lose out on models to control the objective this way. The General will be the Knight Arcanum, who's going to have uh, Master of Magic. Uh, both of the characters will have Flaming Weapon as their additional spell, because the other two are essentially useless. And I picked Bloodthirsty for my triumph. And over here you can see the destruction forces. Yeah, and at the top we're going for an all Gloomspy Gits army, so I picked Zarbag and Zarbag's Gits. I think technically this means I won't get a dirty trick, but it would have been noisy racket. But there's no ranged camp shots going from order, so it wouldn't make any difference. And then with the uh, then with the shooters, I've got the loom boss and the fungal cave shaman. The fungal cave shaman will be the general with master of magic. The loom boss will have the arcane tome as well, and they will both have flaming weapon. And my uh, triumph will be indomitable. So we just need to roll off to see who gets priority in the battle round one. I roll a three. I roll a six. Um, you know what, I think I'll make Order go first. Okay, so we'll be on to Order turn one. So for heroic actions, the Loom Boss used heroic leadership successfully, the Knight Arcanum failed, uh, but the Knight Arcanum did succeed in casting Mystic Shield on the Praetors, and then I've just moved like this, with both of my wizards getting within uh, six inches of the Nexus Siphon objective, which means that uh, then there won't be any shooting or charging or anything, so we just go straight to the end of my turn, where I will score the maximum three victory points, because I hold uh, two or more objectives and also more than destruction. But then we'll be on to destruction turn one. And here's the movement. Uh, we both succeeded on uh, heroic leadership this time, but both of the spells that the Destruction Forces tried to cast were unbound. Yeah, and uh, basically the Loom Boss and the Cave Shaman have run. Spent a command point for the Cave Shaman's run, just getting closer to the middle. Uh, Zarbag and Zarbag's gets also ran. Again, not quite getting all of my heroes in range of the objective, so I won't take it. But in the shooting phase, the shooters will shoot at something. So the shooters are actually going to shoot at the Arch Revenant. They're all just about in range of her. She will get lookouts uh, from the Praetors though, but I think might be slightly more likely to do a bit of damage to her than the Praetors with their 2 plus save. Yeah, and uh, she will use the Uni Arcanum's free command point to have all that defense. Yeah, but I'll use the Loom Boss's command point to have all that attack. After a lot of rolling that we didn't show, that inflicted four wounds, so I'll have four 3 plus saves with all that defense, which I failed one of, so the Arch Revenant takes a wound. So a wound on the Arch Revenant, but nothing further for the turn, except for scoring Victory points, and there will be two because the destruction forces do not control the Nexus Siphon, so only two for the two objectives. And we're on to battle round two. Rolling off once again. Oh, I did a little bit better than last turn, but still lost the roll. Yeah, and I think I'll go first once again. Again? You made me go first. Sorry, you? I think I will go first this time. So, on to destruction turn two. The Arch Revenant failed heroic recovery. Loom Boss generated a command point with heroic leadership and Zarbag will get an extra spell, no extra command point from the Shaman. I'll we'll start with Zarbag, he's going to try and cast Jealous Hex, it's one of his spells. He needs a 6, he gets it with a 6. I will try and use Nine Bind here because it would be quite bad if I were not able to use uh, all that defence, or presumably the Arch Revenant. I'll try and unbind this with the General as well so I get the re-roll, which I don't need, so that is unbound. The 
Loom Boss will try and cast Flaming Weapon. Meaning a four. Yeah, he gets plus one because he's near an arcane terrain piece. So that's uh, a six. Yeah, I won't try and unbind that. So he's got that. And then uh, so I might go an extra spell. Uh, you know, I'll do it. Oh, the Shaman, um, well, actually, I'll do it with him. He'll try and cast Mystic Shield on something. Uh, he gets a four, so I'll have to re-roll it. Into a seven, which is an eight, because he's near an arcane. And I'll use my other unbind uh, from the Arch Revenant on that, which we fail, so that does go off. And zarmag has got an extra spell, so he might as well cast Arcane Bolt. Which he does with an eight. So, in my movement, this has been a sort of general advance. All the heroes have moved up to be in range of the objective. The shooters have come around the skull to get most of them in range of the um, tree revenants. And Zarmags gets them moved up as well. And when Zarbags gets moved, I spent a command point to redeploy the Arch Revenant. Only rolled a two, but trying to keep her uh, away from the fanatic because I uh, might be able to mince her. And then in the shooting phase, the shooters are going to shoot at the tree revenants. Apart from the two, the back right range, I guess, will shoot at the, like the um, Arch Revenant. And uh, the tree revenants will use their free once per turn at all out defense. And also, using free all out attack from um, the Loom Boss's command point. Uh, nothing happened to the Arch Revenant, we didn't get any wounds. We've got eight on the tree remnant. Who have a four plus save thanks to all our defense. But we failed six, so three of them die. And we got three shots from the bowman in Zarbag's Gits as well on fours. No, <laughs> they're not as good as their other brethren. Out the charge phase, Zarbag's going to put a mortal wound on the arch remnant with arcane bolt, and then we're going to spit out uh, the fanatic from Zarbag's Gits, and then Snurk will try and charge the two remaining tree remnants. Gonna need a semi-decent roll for Snurk, more than a four, so we'll have to uh, re-roll that with a command point. Into a five, that's not gonna be enough, I don't think. Well, and seeing as um, Snurk failed, uh, Zarbag's Gits are gonna have a go. They need a good roll though. Well, nine, that might be enough. So Zarbag's Gits actually do manage to get in, they, <laughs> I guess Snurk's a bit confused. A bit too, I had a bit too of the fungus juice, so they managed, they have to do the work. They'll get in, and I will issue them all out attack from the loom boss. Uh, and I think I'll give the cavalry issue themselves all out defense again in the next phase. So we've got two attacks from the squig brand, from um, the squig, the leader of Zomag's gets on twos because of all that attack, they hit. Windy on threes, but sixes do a mortal wound in addition. That's two wounds at minus one. Uh, so fives. Neither. Oh, fours, but that's two damage each. Oh yeah. Yeah, so that's just four damage straight away, so they're dead. Uh, but obviously I can't fight back, so that will be it for this turn. The destruction forces hold four objectives, and gain therefore the maximum three victory points going up to five, and will be on to order turn two. So the Arch Revenant succeeded at heroic recovery this turn and got her missing wounds back. Uh, the Loon Boss also succeeded on heroic leadership. And then the Arch Revenant is going to try and cast Flaming Weapon on herself, needing a four, getting a six. Try and unbind with Zarbag. Nope. And then the Knight of Arcanum is going to try and cast Arcane Bolt, needing a five. So getting a five, but I think I will actually use the uh, command trait to try and reroll for a better roll result than that. Getting a six, well that is better. Well, I'll try and unbind with the Shaman. Yeah, and re-roll that six with Master Magic. Yeah, into an eleven. Into so an eleven, so it's not bad. And then everybody's coming round the top side, as it were, of the Nexus Siphon. We're going to try and stay away from those uh, fanatics down at the bottom, which aren't out yet. So the uh, two heroes going round to go fight the other heroes, probably. And the Praetors are going to have to try and deal with Zarbag's git. So no shooting onto the charge phase, where we will do the Arch Revenant first. Only needing a small roll. Well, uh, 12, however, will be plenty. And I'll just roll the uh, Knight Eye Cannon quickly as well. Uh, she goes a 10, so they're keen. They're going to come round this side. They're going to... Probably tag team Paul Zarbag, the Arch Revenant is within range of the Arcane Terrain feature for next turn as well. And then I will declare a charge with the Praetors. And they roll a 6, which will be enough to get them into Zarbag's Git. So the Praetors will finish like that, uh, but I'm going to pick the Arch Revenant to go first. Well, at the start of the combat phase, she's going to give herself the 4 plus ward, and then put all of her attacks on Zarbag. Yeah, and the Flaming Weapon incidentally is going on this weapon, so giving it plus 1 damage. We have 4 attacks that hit on 3s. That's 3. And and they also wound on threes. Uh, only one, but it does go through because it's minus two ren, so it's yeah. two damage. Zarbag's down to three. And then d3 attacks from the pincers, three, which hit on fours. Now they will miss, so Zarbag is alive for now. So the loom boss is going to pile in to fight the Knight of Cannon. Going to use all out attack on himself with his command point. Uh, but she's going to use all out defense. So five attacks on twos. 
Now we're only getting three. We're only on three sixes to a mortal wound in addition. That's two wounds, minus one. No, so three save, uh, failed one. Uh, D3 plus one damage, thanks to flaming weapon, for three. So she's down to three. I'm going to do the Praetors next, they've managed to pile in so they can all get round Zarbag's Gits and I'm going to use my last command point to give them all out attack. Yep, so that will counteract the net, and I'm using my last command point to give them all out defence. So we have 13 attacks, they're hitting on the threes. We had nine hits, which will also wound on threes. Um, only four. And four six plus saves. Oh, we made one, so all the archers die. And finally, Zarbag's Gits, two attacks from Drizgit on threes with his Squig Prodder. They both hit, wounding on threes, they both wound at minus one. Fours for Praetors, they made those. Then three attacks from Progdenetta on threes, getting two. And fours, getting one, no rend. Now that does a wound. And so that's one damage. Then six attacks from the Squigs on fours, getting three. And threes, getting two more at minus one. And two more damage, so that will kill a the wounded Praetor. And then uh, the four remaining Zarbag skits can be kept in place using the Indomitable Triumph, which is important because it means that Objective 1 remains in destruction control and the Nexus Siphon obviously does as well. So only one victory point for the Forces of Order going up to four, and I think I'm just going to concede at this point because I've got four models left. The Arch Revenant, even if I go first, has to stay in melee to try and kill wizards, uh, or either that or fly away and hold an objective, I suppose, but there's still five Fanatics that can uh, easily kill her or all my Praetors if necessary, and even if I were to take objective one, I'm just never going to be able to hold enough objectives uh, with four models and the number of destruction models still left on the board, so they're just going to keep racking up the victory points. So that'll be a destruction victory in this game, and we'll recap that for you now. So that was the game for issue 47 of Warhammer Age of Sigmar Stormbring magazine. How did you think that went? Um, well, pretty well, obviously. I don't think there's that much to say about the game. I don't think it was terribly well balanced in the grand scheme of things because, I mean, I effectively had seven units to your four because I've got the two units of fanatics. And uh, also I got could have an extra wizard if I took Zarbag. I have no idea why, why I would take Manalt to Cunning and to Cunning Crew. I guess I get a dirty trick and I don't know why you would pick Ilthari and Ilthari's Guardians over the... Art Revenant and the Tree Guard, Tree Revenants, you'd have even fewer models. Yeah, you had, I think, 39, 38 models in this or something like that. Where no, Yeah, you were outnumbered at least three to one. Yeah, yeah and, and Ilthari's Guardians are just the Tree Revenants with two fewer models. Um, and I could, yeah, using the Arcane Tome, I could have an extra wizard anyway, and Ilthari's not as good in melee, so... That was uh, was likely to be my choice. And then um, you did get the double turn, um, but I think it was more that you managed to make a long charge. If you hadn't managed to make that charge, I would have teleported the Tree Revenants onto your back corner objective and been annoying while the heroes went to try and tackle your heroes. And I don't know what the Praetors would have done in that instance. Uh, I wanted to stay away from your massive unit with all the fanatics in it because five fanatics would go through anything I've got and I didn't have any shooting to deal with them. Yeah, so. I don't really see how you're meant to deal with them no. other than... Blaze of the Heavens, I suppose. Yeah, well, actually, that would be a use for Ilthari because her spell was reasonably mm. good at doing a decent number of mortal wounds, but apart from that... Yeah, and we also we start fairly close to each other. And also the fact that, yeah, if I can kill... Or if one side can kill the other's wizards, they can hold the central objective for the entire time as well. We start so close to each other and the armies are still fairly small, so I don't think the game's really going to last that long after. I think I could have done all right if the heroes going in had killed at least one of your heroes without taking any losses, and if the Praetors had managed to actually um, do it more damage to Zarbag's gits. They were unlucky to not kill enough to take yeah, the objective you... back. I should have at least got two victory points, I think, on that. Even then, I think Snurk Sour Tongue, if you rolled decently for his movement and uh, yeah, spent could... a command point for, the, for automatically running six, you could have actually gone and stolen objective two from me. So. Yeah, and I would have had five fanatics to drop on the heroes in the middle. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. The Nexus Siphon, though, is nice. Um, because it's another terrain piece and it's much bigger than the other ones. Yeah, it is a very pretty terrain piece and it's it's nice to have some bigger terrain pieces and more structures and not just piles of things. We'll talk more about this sort of thing in our conclusions at the end of the series but one thing this collection is a bit deficient in compared to previous ones is amount of terrain. While you don't need as much terrain in Age of Sigmar as you do in, say, 40k because there's less shooting, um, it's still nice to have a, a bit more terrain on the board than, than we've been having and especially because all the pieces are small so it makes it a little bit more interesting and we do get another couple of structures structures, uh, which it'd probably be fine, but for two boards that'll, that'll be enough. When we've been playing over three or when we get to four, it might start to look yeah. a little bit barren again, but given that most of the action takes place in the middle of the board, it can at least have a little bit of um, stuff to get in the way now with the amount yeah. of terrain we've got. But yeah, there probably really isn't much to talk about other than that, uh, to be honest, uh, so do let us know what you thought in the comments below. 
uh, leave a like and uh, consider subscribing if you did enjoy the video. We will get through these Age of Sigmar games eventually. Uh, we've been the Tabletop Donkeys, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.